Here we're going to walk you through the programming steps and the logic behind TransPRK and cross-linking using the Schwind Amaris laser platform. This is some work developed with my colleague at Moorfields, Dan Gore, and Sam Arbor Mosquera at Schwind about five years ago. We published this and I'll leave you with a reference at the end so you can dig deeper into it. I recommend watching this video in conjunction with the videos on TransPRK, treatment of irregular astigmatism and programming routine wavefront LASIK. Our aims here are to correct irregular astigmatism. We're very much focused on optical quality rather than correcting the sphere and the cylinder, which can be corrected with spectacles or an ICL later down the track. So it's visual quality we're trying to improve. And in doing this, we're obviously removing some tissue with the ablation and we want to remove the minimum amount of tissue because we don't want to compromise cross-linking efficacy. We want to arrest disease progression. And we also want to maximize the optical zone. That's because we're focused on visual quality here. And the first point to make is that the Munnellin formulae, which we're all familiar with in myopic corrections, where if you reduce the optical zone, you reduce the treatment depth, do not really apply where you're not treating myopia. Where the ablation pattern is more irregular, you'll often find that maximizing the optical zone has very little impact on treatment depth. The second point to make is that we're using wavefront guided treatments wherever we can rather than topography guided treatments. And the reason for that is that Dan and I discovered in test programming on the same eyes that maximum treatment depths were consistently lower for wavefront guided treatments than topography guided treatments. And the interpretation we put on that is that in the ectasias you get a semi-congruent change in the posterior corneal curvature here, which if you trace a light ray through the cornea, you'll see has a partial compensatory effect on the defocus caused by the ectasia in the anterior cornea. So we would recommend using wavefront guided rather than topography guided treatment in the ectasias whenever you have a good wavefront scan sequence and a large enough pupil to give you a good sized optical zone. And indeed that's generally true in irregular astigmatism. If you've got a good wavefront scan sequence, then use that to drive your treatment. Third point to make is that we're not doing what we used to do on the earlier wavefront laser platforms. We're not simply typing in zero and zero into the sphere and the cylinder box here in order to focus on treating irregular astigmatism. If you do this, the laser understands this instruction as saying, yes, let's remove some tissue to regularize the optical shape, but now we need to compensate for the change in the sphere and the cylinder that I've induced in doing that. So we're now going to remove some more tissue to reset the sphere and the cylinder to zero. And it turns out that second phase of ablation often removes more tissue than the first. And one of the really nice things on the Schwinder Maris platform is you can decouple these two things and tell the laser, look, we don't mind what happens to the sphere and the cylinder. We just want to improve the optical quality. And this is what we were using here to minimize treatment depth. So here's our example case, early stage keratoconus, vision better than the driving standard but typically less than 2020 and this is the kind of range you're working in with the lasers in correction of irregular astigmatism if you're much worse than the driving standard you're considering a more gross correction something like intracorneal ring segments to get you onto the starting line for this and then these patients typically have visual quality problems in glasses. If they don't have any visual quality problems in glasses, you have to ask yourself, do I need the laser treatment in addition to the cross-linking or can I just do cross-linking alone? Mixed astigmatism is the typical picture in keratoconus. You've got your optometrist trying to approximate a correction for a coma shape with a regular toric lens. And of course, that's always an approximation. So the visual acuity tends to be reduced. The first task is to review our wavefront scans in the Phoenix software. And we're going to right click on any of these images to pull out the quality indicators. We're looking for the scan with the largest acquisition diameter as a basis for treatment. In young keratoconus patients, we usually find we have a good pupil size, but where we don't, there's always the option of topography guided treatment. The keratometry we're much less interested in that only really modulates the energy in the periphery of the ablation zone, the cosine correction. We're going to be setting our 
pupil offsets to zero for a wavefront guided treatment. You're sampling over the pupil with wavefront guided treatment, so it makes sense to register over the pupil as well, rather than treating on the corneal vertex. So we're through to our treatment planning software and we've imported our wavefront and topography scans. And the first thing we're going to do is to set the pupil offset to zero so that we're centering the treatment registration and tracking on the pupil because it's a wavefront guided treatment. And then we're going to go and hit TransPRK and we're going to tab through then to the planning screen. And it's quite nice at this stage to call up the aberration information. You'll see that coma is dominant there, almost two diopters, and that will be typical in keratoconus. We're then going to maximize the optical zone and hit the manager functions. These default to the refraction tab here. And the first thing we're going to do is instruct the lasers to only correct the higher order aberrations and to do no compensatory additional ablation to reset the sphere and the cylinder to tie it to the manifest refraction. So we're unticking these constraint boxes here and then we're going to go to minimize depth. Now, if you talk to Sam Arbamoscare at Schwind, he argues the case for minimizing tissue volume rather than depth when the ablation pattern is concentrated more in the periphery. You can debate that with Sam, but the protocol that we have always used is to minimize tissue depth here. It takes a moment for the computer to run these calculations, but once it does, you'll see right away that we're saving 79 microns out of a total of 131 microns here. So that's quite a substantial tissue saving. So we're going to hit apply here and you'll see the color change from the last panel there in this preview image. And that's because this is a relative scale. So don't get confused by that. So quite a substantial tissue saving with the first step. We're then going to go to the ablation pyramid here. And again, we're going to hit minimize depth plus. This instructs the laser to only focus on the dominant higher order aberrations. That's those with a value more than three standard deviations from the population mean value. Having done that, we're subtracting the aberrations that are not making so much difference here and saving a bit more tissue here. We're going to click apply and then we're going to repeat the refraction step, untick the constraint boxes here and run that algorithm again and apply that change. The amount of tissue saved in this last iteration is actually very small, but it, again, it's something we've done all the way through when we've been applying this protocol. So then you're ready to hit OK and come through to the treatment planning summary screen again here. And it's quite nice at this stage to compare the higher order aberration map with the ablation map. And you'll see you'll get reasonable congruence there with treatment concentrated over the tip of the cone here, flattening the inferior cornea, but also a compensatory steepening arc of the superior cornea. And this is the ablation pattern you'll see again and again in keratoconus with what I call Jupiter's red spot down here and a compensatory arc over at the top here. You'll notice these manifest refraction numbers are, are changed. Typically, we see a shift towards myopia after the treatment and a reduction in the cylinder. And it's important to tell the patients when they're going into this treatment that it's visual quality you're trying to improve at this stage, that you may need actually more help than spectacles afterwards because of the myopic shift than you did before. However, that's something that can be dealt with spectacles or contact lenses or an ICL later down the track. Also note that the ablation depths now are very small. We're down to about 10 microns in the center of the cornea here, if you subtract the 55 microns epithelial thickness, and less than 30 microns in the periphery if you subtract 65 microns from this. Then we're through to the summary screen, and again, you can see the tissue depths down here are minimal, and that the main focus of the ablation is going to be on coma, and this is a trans-PRK pattern. We experimented with programming with just PRK and then switching through to trans-PRK at the last step. It's a bit easier to see the treatment depths and the changes you're making in the color maps where the amount of stroma removal is less than the epithelial removal in trans-PRK, but we've abandoned that and we simply program in trans-PRK mode now. Then you're gonna hit export 
and that's the treatment ready to go. Here is the reference to our clinical series that we published in JCRS a couple of years back. You can screenshot this if you want to follow that up and dig deeper into this. The headlines are that combining trans-PRK using this approach with cross-linking does improve vision over cross-linking alone and does not appear to affect corneal stability after treatment. So it's very nice as an alternative for patients who have visual quality issues in spectacles in early stage keratoconus. Here's four sequential cases taken at random from that series showing the typical pattern that we see in topography after treatment with a flattening over the apex of the cone here and a steepening of the superior cornea and a more symmetrical resultant shape better centered on the corneal vertex. So not absolute perfection postoperatively, but certainly an improvement in the optical shape. Okay, so that wraps it up and I hope very much that this video was of some use as a supplement to the JCRS paper and will help users of the Schwindemaris platform with a keratoconus practice to get going with this very useful combined treatment modality.